GoForTheTube.com in with the Week 5 predictions. Let's jump right into it. Classic SEC West battle between Arkansas and Texas A&M. You're talking about a team in Texas A&M that challenged Alabama last week before losing 45-23. to Kellen Mond passed for 263 yards in that ballgame, but it was not enough. Alabama attacked Texas A&M's defense vertically for 415 passing yards, were able to wear down the Aggies on the offense and defensive lines en route to the 22-point win over Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher. You're talking about a Texas A&M team now that has faced two college football playoff teams in Clemson and top-ranked Alabama over the last three weeks now have to go on a neutral field in Arlington to face an arch rival in Arkansas. This rivalry dates back to the Southwest Conference days from when both teams were in the conference. Texas A&M has owned the series. They won the last five games by 10 Point eight points per game, and when you look at Arkansas, they're sitting at one and three and haven't made up for that loss on the road in Colorado State, where they held a 27 to nine third quarter lead before allowing that to slip and losing that matchup 34 to 27. But a couple of factors why I think Arkansas could keep this game close against Texas A&M after the loss on the road last week in Auburn. Head coach Chad Morris had a closed-door meeting with the team. He gathered them. He he really chewed them out in that matchup and said that they need to step up and play for four quarters. I think you're going to see a better effort heading into this rivalry game this coming Saturday. Expect Arkansas to play like it's a bowl game. You're talking about an Arkansas defense heading into this matchup that's only giving up 88 rushing yards per game and more importantly, held Auburn in check last week on the road to only 91 rushing yards in that matchup on the road. You're talking about an uh, Arkansas defense as well that does have former Texas A&M defensive coordinator John Chavis as their play caller. Chavis understands the offensive personnel in Kellen Mann and the Texas A&M skilled players. I think that factors into this matchup as well. When you look at te- uh, Arkansas, They're going to look to establish their run. They're only averaging around 163 rushing yards per game. This is an offense that made the transition from Brett Bielma to a more wide open attack in uh, Chad Morris. They don't have the type of personnel to run that type of scheme in year number one. So look for them to force a lower scoring game against Kellen Mond in this ballgame. When you look at a, a transition, a similar transition is Minnesota from Tracy Clays to P.J. Fleck in year number one. They struggled to a 5-7 and seven overall record. They're going to need to run the football to keep Kellen Mond on the sidelines. I think they're able to do it. In the end, Texas A&M does win a low-scoring 28-21 victory over Arkansas in Arlington. Another key battle is TCU and Iowa State. TCU has won four of the last five over Iowa State by 25.2 points per game, but Iowa State did get this victory last year in Ames 14-7. They forced turnovers by TCU quarterback Kenny Hill and more importantly forced that offense to methodically work down the field to score points. When you look at Iowa State, they played very tough week one against Iowa, lost that matchup by 10 points. Followed that up with another solid effort against top-ranked Oklahoma. Lost that matchup by 10 points. And then did get a home win over Akron the week after Akron knocked off Northwestern on the road in Evanston. When you look at this offense for Iowa State, they're only averaging 79 rushing yards per game. But I expect them to run the football better this coming weekend on the road in Fort Worth. When you look at TCU overall... Over the last couple of weeks, to me, they're starting to wear down. They played two physical games against Ohio State and last week on the road against Texas. Two weeks ago, they lost 40-28 to against the Buckeyes, but they allowed 182 rushing yards to Ohio State's offense. Last week, they allowed 112, mostly in the second half, to Sam Ellinger and that offensive line that opened up holes for Trey Watson in the third and fourth quarters. Another cause of concern for me heading into this ballgame is TCU's 
negative turnover margin. Entering this ballgame, they're minus five in turnover margin and have been negative for the last three weeks. It started three weeks ago on the road against SMU. They were negative one. Then they followed that up with back-to-back negative efforts against Ohio State and Texas last week that allowed the Longhorns to pull that victory out. More importantly as well as TCU quarterback Sean Robinson looked like he was hurt at the end of that ball game, he possibly hurt his shoulder. Don't like that heading into this ball game. And I think the fresher team is Iowa State. And they do have solid quarterback plays. Zeb Nolan stepped up. He's completed 51 of 70 passes, taken over for Kyle Kemp. That's right in the area of about 73%. He has big play wide receiver Akeem Butler and David Montgomery in the short to intermediate passing game. I think Iowa State gets the road upset win 34 to 30 over TCU. I think they're catching the Horn Frogs at just the right time in this ballgame. Another intriguing battle is the classic Big Ten battle between Ohio State and Penn State. Ohio State's won four of the last five over the Nittany Lions by 18.7 points per game. They picked up this victory last year in the Horseshoe 39 to 38. Couple of factors why I like Penn State here. You look at the last two years under James Franklin. Penn State, since 2016, 16 and 0 at home. That's right, 16 and 0 at home. And I've won those 16 games by 25.6 points per game. They struggle week one against Appalachian State this year, won that ball game by seven points, then dominated two weeks ago against Kent State. Here's another reason why I like Penn State in this ballgame. Penn State overall in the last couple of weeks has been able to run the football. Two weeks ago against Kent State, they rushed for 297 yards on the ground. They followed that up with a dominant 387-yard effort on the road against Illinois in Champaign. You look at Ohio State's defense heading into this ballgame, they do not have their defensive end, Nick Bosa. That could be a huge loss to that defense heading into this ballgame. When you look at Ohio State's offense, they're averaging 256, excuse me, 265 rushing yards per game, passing for over 300 with Dwayne Haskins heading into this ballgame. But in back-to-back weeks now, the rushing attack has started to slip. They, two weeks ago, rushed for 182 yards against TCU, a smaller TCU defensive front, and they followed that up last week with 151 yards against Tulane. They're going to need a better effort on the road against Penn State's defense. Now, Penn State's given up around over 150 rushing yards per game, but the strength is their secondary, giving up around 173 passing yards to opposing offenses. If Dwayne Haskins is put into long third down situations, that could be the, the, the MO for Penn State right into their strength of their secondary. Now, when you look at Trace McSorley, he struggled now with Joe Moorhead moving on in terms of completion percentage. He's only completed 53% of his passes, over 700 yards, and really hasn't been the same type of quarterback in terms of the passing game that he was last year under Joe Moorhead. But I still think he's the better pocket passer in this ballgame. He's the more experienced quarterback heading into this ballgame, and he's playing at home. Plus, I like the way the offensive line is playing at Penn State. I think Penn State picks up the 35-31 to 31 win over Ohio State this coming Saturday and moves to 17-0 at home over the last two and a half years under James Franklin. Penn State gets the 35-31 to 31 win over Ohio State uh, and moves on to week number six undefeated. Another big, t- uh, excuse me, Pac-12 battle is Notre Dame and Stanford. Stanford's won four of the last five over Notre Dame by eight and a half points per game. They picked up this victory in Palo Alto last year, 38 to 20. They dominated. They were able to stretch Notre Dame's defense vertically. Brandon Wimbush struggled, turned the football over. This is a different Notre Dame team. Ian Book stepped up for the dominating road win over Wake Forest. This was a team last week in Ian uh, Notre Dame and Ian Book that was able to run the football. They pounded the rock for 241 yards on Wake's defense. That allowed Ian Book to work off a play action. You look at uh, Book, he completed 25 of 34 passes, 325 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. He gives Notre Dame 
the ability to stretch Stanford's defense vertically. When you look at the weakness of Stanford heading into this ballgame from a defensive perspective, it is the secondary. Stanford's allowing 233 passing yards heading into this matchup. Go back to last year. Stanford allowed 5 of 14 opponents to pass for over 300. They were 1-4 in, in those games and lost those five game, four games by 6.8 points per game. When you look at last week against Oregon, they allowed Justin Herbert to throw for 346 yards on that defense. Also keep in mind, this is an offense in Stanford that is struggling to run the football consistently. They're only averaging 104 rushing yards per game and more importantly, only rushed for 71 yards last week against Oregon. That's forced them into third down and long situations and heading into this ballgame, Stanford is only converting 36% of their third down attempts. That's a huge difference over the last couple of years when they were able to establish the run on first and second down, which allowed K.J. Costello or Keller Christ over the last couple of years to have manageable third down situations. In 2016 and 2017, Stanford converted 42% of their third down opportunities. Heading into this matchup, it's only 36. They're going to need a better effort on the road. This is back-to-back -back road games. I think that factors into this matchup as well, along with the schedule. Look at uh, Stanford's schedule over the last five weeks. San Diego State, a very physical offense and defense alliance. Pac-12 opponent USC, even though they won that ball game, they expended a lot of energy. They had UC Davis two weeks ago, went on the road last week, had to expend a lot of energy in the second half on the road in Oregon. Now have to go back on the road to face Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame's the fresher team, and they have the better quarterback here in Ian Book. If Book struggles, they could always go to Brandon Wimbush. I think Notre Dame does get a 14-point win over Stanford in this ballgame, 42-28. to 28. Notre Dame does prevail at home and moves to week uh, number six undefeated in this matchup. Let's keep it in the Big Ten, Purdue and Nebraska. Nebraska got blown out by Michigan and has all the fans jumping on Scott Frost. Everybody thought it would be a quick fix year number one. Not the case. They do not have the type of personnel to run Scott Frost's scheme in year number one. But they're facing a team in Purdue that I think they can win this ballgame. Purdue stepped up, had a, a gutty home win over Boston College, won that ballgame 30-13. to David Blau now has been playing lights out. He can, uh, Two weeks ago against Missouri, he lost that ballgame, but passed for 572 yards. Backed that up last week with a 296-yard effort over uh, Boston College's defense. Now he goes on the road to Memorial Stadium. This is Purdue's first road uh, appearance on the year. It's a conference game. Expect Nebraska to be in this ballgame from start to finish. When you look at Nebraska, they're only averaging 185 rushing yards per game. Adrian Martinez got beat up last week, but it doesn't matter. It's Memorial Stadium. Nebraska will be in this ballgame from start to finish. And more importantly, Nebraska will strike the upset 37 to 30 over Purdue. Let's keep in mind, Nebraska won this ball game last year in West Lafayette, 25 to 24. They've won the last two games by seven points per game. Look for Scott Frost to pull out all the stops. And let's look at some of the teams Nebraska has, has played over the last three weeks. Colorado, which is a solid club, has a solid quarterback in Steven Montez. They also face Troy and they face Michigan. Three solid quality teams in my opinion so I think Nebraska is up to the task they run the football and do get a seven point win over Purdue and give Scott Frost his first win as Nebraska head coach two Pac-12 games will go quick USC Arizona USC very disappointing 39 to 36 win over Washington State they now go on the road to face Khalil Tate and Arizona's offense that it rushed for 447 yards en route to the 21-point win over Oregon State. But this is a team in USC that has won the last five games over Arizona by 13 points per game. And JT Daniels is starting to get acclimated into the system. He's completed 58% of his passes, 1,060 yards, four touchdowns, three interceptions. Now, USC is only averaging 110 rushing yards on the ground, 
But look for them to to wear down Arizona in this ballgame. Arizona, in terms of the front sevens, giving up 195 rushing yards to opposing offenses. It's still USC. It's still an offensive line that will look to run the football with Stephen Carr. He'll be getting more uh, carries in this ballgame. And let's keep in mind, USC... Even though they're sitting at 2-2, two and two, they've played some quality opponents. They played UNLV with a dynamic quarterback in, in Armani Rodgers and Lexington Thomas. They're a much improved team. They played Stanford, they played Texas, and they played Washington State. Very quality teams over the last four weeks. Arizona hasn't lived up to par. They've underachieved under Kevin Sumlin up until this point. I think USC dominates this matchup. Look for USC to win this ball game 47 to 30 over Arizona on the road. Let's keep it in the Pac-12. Washington State Gardner Minshew had an opportunity to pull that victory out on the road in the Coliseum. Now comes back home to face a Utah team that has an extra week of preparation after that 21 to 7 loss to the Huskies at home. When you look at this ball game, Washington State won this matchup 33 to 25 over uh, uh, Utah last year on the road. They now come back home in Pullman. It's a very difficult place to play, but I think the extra week of preparation is the difference for me with their head coach Kyle Whittingham. You're talking about a Utah team giving up 12 points per game, 93 passing yards per game, and more importantly holding opposing offenses to 23% on third down conversions. I know Utah hasn't looked consistent, but they still have a rock solid defense heading into this matchup. Washington State is solid as well, but with a week off of preparation, look for Tyler Huntley, look for Utah to attack Washington State and look for Zach Moss to get going early. I think it's high scoring as well. I think Utah wins a high scoring game 40 to 30, Utah prevails 10 points on the road and does move, uh, gets a conference win over uh, Washington State in this battle. We're just getting started. Stay with me all season long at GoForTheTwo.com. That's GoForTheNumber2.com. More picks. If you want more picks throughout the uh, week number five, tune in to the College Football Today show, Cable Vision or Optimum, channel 238 in the New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut area, channel 238 on Cable Vision or Optimum, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, College Football Today. Or you can tune in to Fantasy Sports Radio Network, fntsy.com backslash radio, or go to 10 o'clock Eastern Time Saturday morning to YouTube, FNTSY, College Football Today. Stream it on your computer or on your phone. Stay with me all season long. College football is the best. I just love talking about it.